to Shane 11 with some book love, so let's chat. I have a little bit of a stack. Honestly, I don't have a ton of books that I've read since the last time we talked. I only have a few because it hasn't been that long since I filmed, but I have been busy trying to clean up around here. So like the stack that's over here where I mentioned it to you, but it doesn't have a Goodreads review, or um, I picked it up in a book haul and talked to you about it, but didn't really do an accurate like saying about it, talking about it or whatever, then uh, that's what I'm trying to revisit a little bit more today. And of course I do have another book haul. So even though I'm cleaning up, I just keep adding to the chaos. Uh, so give me a minute to move these things around and then we will talk about the books that I finished since the last time I talked to you. We'll do some revisits and then we'll do some book haul. Sound good? I think it sounds great. All right, well, first off, Let's see, the last time I videoed, looks like it was Wednesday, July 13th, and today is Friday, August 4th, I'm pretty sure. And this might be another one of those times where I start out now, I'm gonna film for, I've got about two hours before I have to leave to go to a stamp convention not the lick and stick kind, but the rubber stamp con convention, like where you make cards and paper arts and that sort of thing. Um, I think I've been going for about 20 years now, if not more. And uh, that is this evening. So I have to leave in about two hours-ish. But um, because I didn't have as many to talk to you about um, that I've been reading over the past, the past month since I've um, released a video, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because I feel like I can make a big dent in this video if not get the whole thing done. So there's that. I am already dressed for the stamp convention. Got on my um, typewriter shirt and my Tim Holtz necklace. Tim Holtz is a big guy in the um, rubber stamp world, art world. I don't know what you call that craft world. Um, but several years ago, he came to Stamp Away and I took a class and we made these awesome like steampunk necklaces. And um, and it's a, a little heavy, <laughs> but I really do love it. So super cool. All right, so that changes so that you can see that we are filming today on Friday, August 4th, and I will hopefully get it all done and then edit and get that out really, really soon. But let's start off by talking about some of these books that I have read here lately. Um, I've had a great year reading. I am on, I think, book 62. My goal for the year is around 101. I like to read either 100 pages or about an hour a day, listen to audio about an hour a day, something like that. Um, and I feel like that's gonna put me around that 101 mark. So I'm happy with that. I feel like that um, is a good number for me not to feel too crazy, but also to know that it motivates me um, to be reading and not always just endlessly scrolling or watching television or just, I'm a putterer. I mean, I can putter away an entire day. Um, and speaking of that, we have one more week before school starts back. If you've been with me before, you know I teach high school English. Um, so we have one more week and then school starts on that Monday. So I am eating up those summer days and today's been a good one. I got up super early and um, got a lot of stuff done and just, you know, spent some time out on the porch. I've already read some. I watched a couple of episodes of Skimwalker Ranch while I cleaned the kitchen. Like it's been a really good day. So I hope that continues here. Um, and let's talk about some of those books. My drink is not exciting at all today. I just have Coke on ice. I know it looks like it's wine, but it's not. It's just Coke uh, because I am meeting a bunch of my crafter friends for dinner prior to going to the stamp convention. Um, so, you know, you don't need to be drinking cocktails before I go for cocktails. But the first book I want to talk to you about is number 58 for the year. It is Fourth Wing. Um, it is part of a series. It is called the Imp Empyrean. Imp Empyrean? Empyrean, I guess. Uh, it's the first one in that series. It is by Rebecca Yaros. Um, I have talked to you a little bit about this book already because I was listening to it, I think, the last time I was filming the video. And man, it was hard to turn off so that I could do something else. I was so interested in it. I came across this book through my YouTube, uh, Killing Time with Cozies, Beach Bum, Bookworm uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I'll share that. I've shared that before, but I try and meet up with them, uh, you know, via YouTube chat video um, about once a week. Usually it's on a Saturday or a Sunday, a couple of hours, and then there are some off shots with other people in the group where they will hold um, chats and reading sprints Monday night, 
Wednesday night, maybe, I don't know. But, um, you know, at least once a week, I try and make it somewhere. And during one of those, there was a lot of talk about this fourth wing book. Now, it is not a cozy. It is not young adult, which is what I thought it was. I thought it was going to be like young adult fantasy. It is not. I would call it new adult because the main character is a 20-something. I want to say she's 21, maybe 22. Um, she is at the point in her life and in their civilization, their world, where she is put into what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. She thought she was gonna be a scribe, uh, which is kind of like a historian, educator kind of thing in their society. And instead her mother, who is over like a commander in this world, this civilization, um, she puts her in like a military school. Uh, and she wasn't prepared for that. She's not particularly built for that. Her brother and sister, older, uh, both did that, but her dad really pushed her to be a scribe. That's what she thought she was going to do, but it hasn't ended up that way. And for some reason, when they were talking about it in the group, the, the main conversation was how hard it was to get a copy of this book, either in print or even like through your library or even an audio book online. I'm not really sure why that is, but that was the talk and it was across the board. And then since then, I've heard that over and over and over and over again. So it wasn't just like in our group. Now, the group that I'm with, The Killing Time of Cozies, they're from everywhere, Canada, United States, just all across the way. So it wasn't like it was a regional thing and I heard it over and over and over again, um, which I thought was weird. Now, they did, I don't have a copy of this book. I've seen, I've seen copies of this book, but I've not seen the copy that I think caused the initial stir, which was the, um, do you call it end pages? I think like this part here, and it was a different color. So it's a really beautiful book that I've seen <laughs> um, online that I've never seen in, in person. But while they were talking about it, I just hopped on my Libby and requested the audio and it was instantly available. So I'm like, gosh, I should probably get this since everybody else is having a hard time and there's like the stir over this book. There's a fly. Why is there always a fly in here whenever I'm videoing? I don't know. Maybe because I have the door open. Anywho, um, I was able to get it immediately. It is a long book. I don't know that I have on here how long, but man, I want to say it was 12, 13, 14 hours. Like it's a long audio, but I did not lose interest at any point. Now, I'm also not a huge fantasy reader. Like I love Harry Potter, one of my favorite series. I enjoyed Hunger Games, um, Divergent, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like all of those fantasy series, I enjoy them. I love Harry Potter, I enjoy the others. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that I pick up fantasy books on my own, I don't. Like I'll, I'll pick them up if it's something like that I think that I'm gonna need to recommend to the kids or it's gonna be, you know, popular in my classroom. Um, I will read them and I enjoy them, but it's not my go-to genre. So I wasn't really expecting to love this book, but I did want to be familiar with it since it was so popular um, and I loved it. Now, that being said, I'm not going to be able to recommend this in my high school classroom because it does have a lot of language, not just like a little bit, like I'm not a big censor, you know, kind of person. Um, a lot of times in my classroom, I, like I will tell them about this book. Um, but I won't book talk it and suggest it and recommend it. I, I, it's, it is definitely new adult, not young adult. Um, but it was a five star read for me. It also has some really cringy parts. Like there are a couple of cringy words for me, not moist, but you know, just some cringy words for me. And it really liked a couple of those words. It said it several times. And that was a little cringy to me, but you know what? I can get over cringy. We uh, went and saw the Barbie movie a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my husband just wanted to go to the movies and he suggested Mission Impossible. Not a huge fan of that franchise, but I'm like, but Barbie's playing. I've heard it's really good. And uh, we were both just blown away by the Barbie movie uh, that we thought it was, you know, it didn't get good review. Like my sister was like, don't go watch it. It's stupid. Don't go watch it. Um, but I was like, I've really been hearing some things like I want to watch it. And then I loved it. My husband tolerated it. He chuckled quite a bit. Uh, and then there were several things we discussed about it, like the, about the audience and who was there and how people reacted during the film and after the film, um, that we had a really good conversation about it, which is one of the things I like to do when we get out of the movie theater. Uh, but it again had some very cringy parts to it. But in the end, I'm still telling you, like, I highly recommend it. And I think it's a really good movie to talk about. So there's that. It's common culture. Enjoy it. Anywho, this has some of those cringy things to it, but it still made it a five-star read for me. 
Uh, you know, the, the enemies to lovers trope is so ordinary, it's not even unique anymore, but it's well done in this. It is definitely well done. If that's a trope you like, this is a great enemies to lovers trope. It's very satisfying. I did not know it was going to be a series until I finished it. And the way it ended, I'm like, there's no way that's not going to be a series. And it is. It's the first in a series. It ends on a cliffhanger, though, that's very satisfying. Um, I can't think of a great example for you right now, but there are a lot of those books that I read and it's too much of a cliffhanger on the end or it doesn't tie up loose things or it drops something new at the end that frustrates me. And this was not that way. I really, really enjoyed the twist at the end. I enjoyed the cliffhanger at the end. It's called War College. So she thought she was going to scribe college. She ended up going to War College because her mother, the, the general, required her to do that. Uh, in this War College, it is, it's very elite. It is very brutal. Um, it is descriptively violent at places. And actually, the main character's name is Violet. And um, her nemesis refers to her as violence, which really irritates her at the beginning. She gets over it. Uh, but it is very violent. They, there are dragons. I think that's the other thing. I do always enjoy a dragon story. And that's another one that there just aren't a lot of books out there that are well done with a dragon in them. So I was hoping this would be another one that I would be able to recommend in my classroom. That's okay. But um, uh, it probably is a little more Game of Thrones dragons than, you know, like a Harry Potter dragon. When you're in this war college, you may or may not get chosen by a dragon, and that is a very big part of the story. Um, and Vi Violet does get chosen, and in a very unique way that brings even more attention onto her. You know, she goes to the school. Her mom's the general. People know that. They feel like she's going to get special treatment. Um, and then something happens when the dragon chooses her that people are like, come on. But it works. It really does work. There is a very strong Hunger Games vibe um, between the love triangle and the survival stress as you're reading it. But for people who grew up on maybe like Dragon Riders of Pern or Aragon or Harry Potter and they're ready for that next, like making it more adult, this is a really good, what I would call a reading ladder to that. It's a great, good fantasy for, um, you know, again, Harry Potter people, anybody who enjoyed those dragon stories when they were a little more innocent um, and have been increasing and increasing and increasing. Here we go. <laughs> so highly recommend it. I made it a five-star read. The um, next book that I read, I read a couple of different ways. Um, and the first way that I encountered it was um, an audio, and the audio was called Agatha Christie, The Lost Plays, Three BBC Radio Full Cash Dramas, Butter in a Lordly Dish, Murder in the Muse, and Personal Call. So once again, if you're new here, huge Agatha Christie fan. I run an Agatha Christie book club. Uh, we meet online, we Zoom every two to three weeks and discuss an Agatha book in chronological order as best we can. It's complicated, uh, but that was our next one to discuss was Murder in the Muse. And um, I came across this when I was trying to track down like how I wanted to read um, Murder in the Muse because Murder in the Muse is a short story. So we were reading that with several other stories um, that fall under the title of the book of collected short stories, Murder in the Muse. Um, and it was great. It's an audio where it is more of a dramatization, um, but I really enjoyed that. Uh, and then I went on to then read the book or read the short stories within this book. This is Agatha Christie, Hercule Perrault's case book. It was put out by Dodd and Mead. And then you can see, like it was great because it happened, you know, during the summer. So I was able to review these other short stories that we've already read chronologically with um, my Agatha group. And they are from Perrault Investigates. Uh, and the ones that we were doing this time fell under the title of From Dead Man's Mirror, which included Dead Man's Mirror, The Incredible Theft, Murder in the Muse, and Triangle at Rhodes. So, um, you know, we had those four short stories that we were trying to discuss. So I read them in here. I listened to them on the um, BBC, um, the dramatization, and both of those were great ways to do that. In addition, most of them have, um, most of them? I don't know. 
Yeah, most of them have adaptations on the television series, um, on the Agatha Christie's Perot with David Suchet. All four stories actually have one hour episodes on that series. I highly recommend reading Agatha Christie. I highly recommend watching the David Suchet TV series, Agatha Christie's Hercule Perot. I love them. I think they're so well done um, on the page and off the page. Um, if you're looking at like how much is that, it looks like about this much was what we read for this particular um, discussion. Oh, and there's a great, this has a great, um, like this was the cover for the book. I took it off because it's a little, a little fragile. It's yellowing and torn, but look how beautiful that is. And then it has the 50 stories on the back listed, but um, it's, that's lovely. <laughs> Probably want to see this side. That is absolutely lovely. And that is this particular book. So I don't know if I'm doing a great job of like, it's not going to stay on there like that. You probably would prefer if I put it here and here. How's that? All right, what else do I want to tell you about this? I did go ahead and listen to the other plays and the um, three plays, the BBC ones, um, Butter and a Lordly Dish and Personal Call. I'm sure they'll come up later in our chronological reading, but I did go ahead and listen to those too. And I'm pretty sure um, the, what's the butter one? Butter and a Lordly Dish. I'm pretty sure I'd already seen an adaptation of that one. These stories have a lot of those Christie hallmarks that we are constantly talking about. Um, and they're described actually as novellas, not short stories. Don't really know why they're a little longer than a short story. How long is a short story? How long is a novella? I don't know. But when I started looking into it uh, to gain my background information to have the discussion, it did describe them as novellas and not short stories. So some of those Christie Hallmarks, blackmail, suicide, love, wills, inheritance, espionage, theft, adoption, poison, and of course, murder. I don't know, uh, it's been a long time since we've read one that doesn't have murder. Most of those I think were Parker Pines didn't always have a murder and maybe the Harley Quinns didn't always have a murder. But I enjoyed each of these stories um, as much as I enjoyed a novel. We had a great discussion around them. I think I've mentioned this before, but I always print out the uh, Wikipedia with the Agathas. And I love that over here on this side, it tells you that this was preceded by Cards on the Table and followed by Dumb Witness. But we already did Dumb Witness because we are following the chronological list that's on the actual Agatha Christie website. They have a chronological list that you can access. And so that is the chron chronology that we are following. Agatha gives us a lot of really great characters in this. You know, it's one of the main things I love about Agatha are the characters that she creates. In addition to Hercule Perot and Hastings, who we absolutely love. Um, oh, and speaking of that, I don't think Hastings is in any of these uh, novellas, but he is in the TV adaptations. I feel like that we are um, done with Hastings until we get to the very end. And then I feel like the last Hercule Perot is a curtain, maybe. He comes back in that one, but I don't think we see Hastings for a long time, which I'm sad about because I really like Hastings. But you have the four short stories, Murder in the Muse. This is one where Hercule Perot shows up after the murder, so he's not been somewhere and knows the people prior to. He's called in by Jap to um, figure out what, what happened to this person who supposedly committed suicide the night before. The Incredible Theft. This is one about espionage. I don't know that this one includes a murder now that I'm thinking about it. There's a theft and he figures out, you know, what happened, who did the theft and why everyone was called to the house for this theft. But um, you know what? I don't know. I don't know that there was a murder in that one. And then Dead Man's Mirror.
And this is a fun one because um, there's a little, you know, poke on the fact that someone basically tells Hercule Poirot to show up, like they need him and you need to be there without asking. And Hercule Poirot is like, who do you think I am that you get to just tell me what to do? But then when he hears about what's going on, then he's like, okay, I want to go. Like, I want to be able to solve this. And then Triangle at Rhodes, I had already seen, um, a t the, I think, the TV adaptation before I read the book, so I kind of knew what was going on there. Um, and that's a really good one. It's another one that, man, you can't trust anybody. It's a love triangle. Yes, love triangle. So I would highly recommend any of those short stories. And, you know, if you're someone who hasn't read Agatha Christie, she has lots of short stories and then these novellas where you could see if you like her writing. All four of those um, are very Agatha Christie-ish. So you could, you wouldn't go wrong with, with um, any of those. This is another Anthony Horowitz. I know I've talked to you about him in most of the videos. Um, he was the adapter for Dead Man's Mirror in the seventh episode in series five of the Hercule Poirot. Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot, I think is the official name. Mr. Satterwaite is actually mentioned in the books, but does not show up in the adaptation. Uh, speaking of Agatha, if you go um, on the official Agatha Christie website, you can also print off this. This is the Hercule Poirot reading list. There's a UK version and a US version. This is another reason why we've had a hard time when we're doing the chronological, because sometimes it was published in the UK before it came to the US, or sometimes it was published in a US publication before it was then put into a book in the UK. It's craziness. It is. I'm okay with that. But you can print that off and you can see like the top Hercule Poirot novels. And then there's also a reading list that tells you like the chronology of it. Um, and then in addition to that, you can sign up for their newsletter and you can get a copy of this. This is the world of Agatha Christie and it's got a couple of excerpts. Again, if you have not done Agatha Christie before and you just want to know like, do you like her writing? This is a good way to do that. It also had um, a crossword that as much as I study Agatha Christie, I struggled with, but I enjoyed. Uh, the next book that I did is number 61, and it's called Pleading the Fish. Right over there. It's this little guy. Now, this is kind of a different sized cozy. I'm not very good on the book sizes. I'm trying to get better about that. I think this is called a trade paperback, pretty sure, but it's kind of a different size. It is called Pleading the Fish. It's by Brie Baker. It's part of the Seaside Cafe Mystery Series. And it has this little news sticker on here. Um, I remember purchasing this book. I went into the, I think it's called the Book Rack on Beachmont Avenue here in Ohio. And um, I was looking for Agathas. I'm always looking for Agathas. I don't have a complete collection. They are right there, I believe. But I don't have a complete collection, so I'm still looking for those. So I ran in to see if they had any Agatha Christie's, and they did not. And it's just a very small bookstore, and I wanted to give them some patronage. And I saw this on, like, a summer display, so I picked it up. I did not realize that it was the last in the series, number seven of a series of seven. But it did not matter. I was easily able to pick it up, start reading it. There's a prologue that kind of gives you, sets up the story a little bit, tells you what's happened before. Um, and then once she starts the story, you just instantly fall in with all these people. Super easy to do. Um, but I will go back and read more in this series. I did really enjoy it. I enjoyed it more than a regular cozy. Um, I gave it four out of five. So, you know, if I read a cozy and it's just okay, it would be three out of five. This is four out of five. It's not great literature. It's not life changing, but it is super, super good. I really liked the humor. I liked the main character. Um, I thought she was very witty, very personable. I enjoyed um, how she was running a shop by the seaside. It was, uh, what's the name of the store? Sun, Sand, and Tea. She sells iced tea, like 25 different kinds of iced tea a day among food. And you do other stuff too. But um, it has that kind of a cozy, like, how's anybody making a living here? I don't know. But uh, she is also very close to two elder, elderly aunts who are very um, quirky. Just super, super good, small community great humor, some superstitious stuff within the um, storyline. So it is a little bit kooky, but in a good way, I like kooky. It's set in the Outer Banks. And the um, setting feels like a character when you're reading this story. Like, you know you're in the Outer Banks, they're in a seaside community, there is seaweed involved, there is sand involved, she takes walks on the beach. It is like a character in the book. 
Now, that being said, I don't know really how to describe this, but sometimes I would be reading along and it would have that, like just great writing, just a great sentence, a great paragraph. It would get a little more serious, but not heavy. It was never depressing, um, but it just, I really, really enjoyed the writing on this. And I will look and see, I'm sure Brie Baker has written other series. I haven't really looked that up yet, but I'm sure she has other series, but I would like to go back and do the beginning of this series. I could totally see this made for a TV movie. Um, you know, like a series on Hallmark, this would be a great one. So Hallmark, if you're looking for something to invest in, this will be a good one. Make it happen. And then this is crazy. I think this is the least number of new books that I've talked to you about, but that's okay because I have so many of the others to get to. The last one that I want to talk to you about today is my latest book club read. It is called Hornet Flight by Ken Follett. It's a doozy. Look at that. Now, that being said, it, you know, it's a little paperback. So that is, again, it's if it were bigger, it wouldn't look this massive. It only has 518 pages. But man, I, when I picked it up, I'm like, what is it going to be like a thousand pages? It's going to take forever. And you can tell on the front, it's World War II. This is not my genre of historical war fiction. Come on. Uh, but that being said, really enjoyed it. Um, did I do three out of five? I think I did do three out of five instead of four out of five, just because it was an okay read for me. Now, if you like war fiction, it's a five out of five. Like it goes into detail. You know, I have said before, this is how I probably get my history lesson is when I'm reading historical fiction. Um, I'm just not super interested in um, World War II fiction but it's well done. I've not read any other Ken Follett, and I do think he is one of those modern authors who writes a lot of fiction based around war fiction. He did The Pillars of the Earth, which I don't really know what that's about, but um, I always look at it and think, yeah, I should probably read that, but I don't think I own any books by him. If so, I'll, I always check that like after I do the video, um, but I don't think I own any books by him. Um, I've been told that The Pillars of the Earth series is a must read, but I just haven't gotten to it yet. I read the print copy, and in addition to that, there were two audio versions I got my hands on, um, and I didn't listen to the full um, version of the audio. I want to say it was 12 or 14 hours. I listened to a six-hour abridged version, which I am not normally someone who says you should listen to the abridged, but I felt like for my purposes, reading this and then um, supplementing that with the audio was the way to go and I agree it was. It was enough for me. Um, I don't know what I missed. You know, the, I don't really remember as I was reading along and then I was listening to it. I couldn't remember what parts were really left out in the audio. So I feel like I'm okay there. My book talk, my book club will talk about this book next Thursday. So I might have a little more to say after that. And I do always appreciate a book more after we've talked about it. So if you're not in a book club, I would highly recommend that you join a book club, either online or in person, doesn't really matter, as long as you have an opportunity to hear other perspectives from people who've also read the book about the same time that you have. I just think it's a great way to enhance my love of a book. It always does. I, I always have a better appreciation after our book club discussions. It was published in 2002. I don't know why I thought it was an older book than that, but it is not. It has Winston Churchill in it if you're looking for a name drop. But there are a group of people um, that are resisting the Nazi occupation. It has a lot, obviously, Hornet Flight. It has a lot to do with um, airplanes, World War II airplanes. The people that are leading the resistance have something to do with airplanes. You do see both sides. It's not like um, you only are getting one perspective. You are getting perspectives from both sides of the war. Um, but man, that police detective, Peter Fleming, you're a terrible person. <laughs> you are a terrible person. <laughs> I would call this a fictionalized um, or a novelization of an actual event. Obviously, the World War II and the events that they're describing have all taken place, but the characters are not real people. Most of them, Winston Churchill is real, um, but most of them are not real people. I think that somebody said there was something in the prologue and they mentioned like a black serviceman and people were like, that's not true, that that, that didn't exist. And then since then, of course, people have come out and said, um, yeah, hello, I was there, I'm black, I functioned in this position. So um, I think that that's another great thing when you're reading these books that you may have thought 
you knew enough or you knew something about World War II and the um, logistics around that. And you always learn a little more when you're reading a fictionalized book like this because you have to look it up and be like, is that true? Did we do that? Did that happen? Or did that event take place? Or is this, are they just making this up? So super good. And once again, I printed out the um, Wikipedia discussion because I will take that to my book club. I uh, Another good thing that I like when you go to Wikipedia is sometimes it'll have like the list of characters and this is character heavy, very Agatha-ish, um, very character heavy. So when I was reading along, I had to stop and go back and look and see, like I made notes before. I usually don't do the Wikipedia until afterward. I probably should have done that ahead of time on this one. But I had to go back and make some notes like who's who, what side are they on, what's their position here. You can tell like how people had alliances and this person was a fiance to this person. I will also say that I was not expecting as much romance. I don't even know. Some of it wasn't just romance. It was just flat sexual. Um, but I wasn't really expecting that in this, in this Ken Follett one. Um, but yeah, it's well done. Like I'm not saying that is a bad thing. I'm just saying I wasn't really expecting that. Um, he writes like a male novelist approaching um, sex during World War II between people. <laughs> How's that? It's a little awkward, but it does bear mentioning because there were times when I was like, oh, I don't really need to hear that. Thanks, though. <laughs> All right, that is it for the books that I have read since last time I talked to you. So give me a minute to bring the next ones up so we can do some revisits. Um, especially for books that I have book hauled or mentioned to you and I didn't have Goodreads out there. I got on a kick of getting some of my Goodreads caught up, so I want to catch you up on those. Okay, I think this is a good way to get started. So this is for the revisits, corrections, updates, and I do want to start off with Pat Conroy. So I know I've talked to you about him before, um, and I did some book hauls, and then when I did the book hauls and I was talking to you about him, I realized that I had not... Um, ah, I realized that I had not um, talked to you, like book talked his books for you. So I had borrowed this book last summer from a friend, Pat Conroy's The Water is Wide, um, and I will be returning that to them because I found it thrifted. So I still haven't read it, but I do plan on reading it. Um, something to know about Pat Conroy is that he is either from or has settled, pretty sure he's from, um, that area down there where my friend that I borrowed this from, Chris, um, she and her husband moved down there. They retired down there to Buford, South Carolina. I think it's Buford. Uh, and they have, and my other friend Louisa also lives down there on um, Harbor Island. And the when you go across, like from where Harbor Island is, Huntington Island, you go across, and I think that's Buford right there. I think that's what that, that's called. They have a Pat Conroy Center, like that you can go in and his books and things are there and they hold events there. Um, so that's why I want to continue reading some of his works. But we read uh, South Abroad with my book club years and years ago. Um, so that was my introduction to Pat Conway back then, but I did not have a, a Goodreads review out there. So we read this with our book club in December of 2010. It is a longer, more literary um, read than we usually do in our book club. It's a more serious read, I think, than we normally do in our book club, um, but it was well received across the, the book club. And it gave us a great discussion. The characterization in any Pat Conroy book, um, I, that seems to be one of his hallmarks. And in South Abroad, there are friends. There's a group of, I think, four friends. Um, and you follow them through from like how they were when they were growing up and they were friends and then now and how complicated a lot of their stories are. I remember it was very heavy on the character driven. Um, I remember that it was very heavy on being character driven. It's one of those stories where the whole story really is about the backstory. So you may know these four people and you may meet them today, but the whole story that you're going to hear is something that happened in the past. That is Pat Conroy. Now, um, he does that in several of his books. I haven't read his more autobiographical ones that are like, um, I think it's called The Great Santini is one about his father. And I want to say he has another one that's about his father. Um, so I have not read those. Some of his other books that you may have heard of, though, The Prince of Tides, which was turned into a movie. I've seen the movie. I don't think I read the book. 
Uh, the Great Santini is one that I, I think is about his dad. He has one called Beach Music, and he has one called The Lords of Discipline. Um, my Losing Season is also one by him. So I really look forward to reading this one. I wanted to read it this summer, and I just didn't get to it yet. I also read Pat Conroy's uh, My Reading Life, but I do not have a copy of it. But I did add a Goodreads for that one, too. Now, uh, if you're someone who likes books about books, <clears throat> if you're someone who likes to read um, authors that talk about books or talk about their reading life or how it changed or how it shaped them as a writer, this is another good one that you would want to put on your list. It's called My Reading Life. Uh, and it is, you know, a reader's love story. It's Pat Conroy talking to you about how reading shaped who he is, especially as a writer, but as a person coming from this very difficult childhood that he had. I could actually do a re-listen of that one. I'm pretty sure I did listen to it on audio and I want to say that Pat Conroy actually read it. Uh, this one takes place, the South Abroad takes place in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So if you are looking for those books that are set in those places that you have fallen in love with over your years of vacationing there, um, that this is one of those books. It does have, um, it does deal with the subject of suicide and it's a child suicide. So you know, it's, it's dark. That's what I remember about his books is they are very dark. They're twisted. If you have read or watched The Prince of Tides, man, that is a haunting, haunting story. So is this. Uh, this is set in like 1960s to 1980s, um, growing up in the 60s. So it has that kind of culture going on in it too. So I don't know. I, I feel like it might be time for us to do another Pat Conroy in our book club because uh, we have so many people who you know, have vacationed in that area, fallen in love with the culture in Charleston, Buford, that South Carolina area. Um, and I think that all of his books, when they're touching on that, it's just, um, it's something that I think our book club would like to do another read for. So I'll have to ask what other ones other people have read, but I'll read this one and maybe that'll be a next year. So my book club, uh, if you've heard me talk about it before, um, it was my, um, graduate project when I went to library school 20 years ago. So we've been meeting since 2001. Uh, we were in a book a bookstore the other day. I had two book club members with me and uh, we were talking about the book club a little bit because we're getting ready to make our next year's selections. And uh, the guy that was working there said, your book club's older than I am. I was born in, I don't know what he said, like 2004 or something. It was like, yeah, my book club is older than you. <laughs> um, but anywho, um, I think that this might be another one that we might want to choose for next year, but my book club is setting our reading list, um, next Thursday. So if this goes out before then, please leave me a comment. What is your book club reading? What have they read that you would suggest? We are all over the place. We do some literary, we do some funny, we do some light. Um, we love a good historical mystery. Um, Mm, we do all kinds of stuff. We always do a memoir. We always do some nonfiction. So we're all over the place. So I will take any suggestions that you might have. The next author I want to revisit with you is Catherine Ryan Hyde. We had this book on our book club list this year, and this is terrible. I rarely ever don't read one of our book club selections. I just got busy and I love this author. <laughs> um, she wrote one of my all time favorite books. Love in the Present Tense. Um, so I have this on my short list. I need to read it. It's Have You Seen Louis Valdez? And um, one of my book club members said that they were gonna loan it to me and they're like, hey, just add it to your collection when you're done. She read it to some of my classes when she was subbing. So I think it's one that I'll be able to put in the classroom um, and recommend to my students, but I've gotta read it. But when I was talking to you about that one, I realized that I had not, um, talk to you like this is pay it forward i've not read this one by her either so this is on my short to be read list but i did not have a review out there for love in the present tense and it's one of my like all-time favorite books it's something that i look back on and i remember and there are certain scenes in the book that are especially um just like i just remember it i recall it and i think about it all the time and i think about the goodness of man and how sometimes 
humanity surprises me <laughs> and I need it to surprise me sometimes because teaching is hard and there are terrible, terrible stories. And, you know, you just see humanity in a different light when you teach, especially in a rural impoverished district, but probably everywhere, probably even if you teach at a rich school, you have a lot of family trauma going on. I'm sure you do. Um, so I'm sure it's everywhere, but sometimes I just need to remember that there are good people in the world and that we will help each other and we will surround someone who needs it. And that's what happens in love in the present tense. I don't have a copy of it, but, um, I read it over a decade ago and I still vividly remember the scenes in this book. When we meet Leonard, who's a little boy, I think he's four or five years old and his mom, Pearl, Pearl had Leonard when she was like maybe 13 or 14 years old, a terrible situation, but she has raised him. She is trying to make it. Um, and one day she leaves Leonard with a neighbor um, just for a little bit so she can go take care of some business and she doesn't return. So this neighbor, what's the neighbor's name? Oh, I don't have it on here and I can't think of his name, but the neighbor, Mitch, there we go. Uh, the neighbor, Mitch, has Leonard. He doesn't mind, you know, holding on to him every once in a while, just letting him hang out in his apartment. He's a young guy. He doesn't have a significant, you know, other with him. Um, so this little five-year-old hanging around watching TV while he's doing stuff at his house, it's not a big deal. But when Pearl doesn't come home, he's not really sure what to do with that because he's this young, you know, unattached um, male and now here's this kid that doesn't belong to him and he doesn't like, how do you navigate that? But he does, he surrounds Leonard, he holds on to him, he helps them. And it is a story where you follow Leonard as he is growing up and as he and Mitch um, try and figure out how to make this work. Uh, and it is just a beautiful, beautiful human story. And I think that's what Janet Hyde is known for. I think that's um, when people have talked about this, when they've talked about paying it forward, it's very much the same thing where it's a very inspirational story. So I'm going to do this when it's on my very short list and then eventually I'll get back to paying it forward. But uh, if you have not read Love in the Present Tense by Ryan Hyde, read it immediately. I loved it, loved it, loved it. I also think that we may be reading another Catherine Ryan Hyde. Um, next year, someone suggested another book by her. When they read this, they read another one and they were like, it was actually funny. And we do not have a lot of humorous books on our list. Um, so I'm gonna you know, bring that one back up and see if maybe that's one that they want to revisit. Um, we'll see. The next author that I wanna talk to you about, I think I've only talked to you about him one time. Um, I've got these out of order, so. Oh, it's because there's a whole stack. Give me just a second. This is why they were out of order. There was this whole stack, so I couldn't like add it to the other ones. The next author that I wanna talk to you about is Robert uh, B. Parker. Look at this cover. Again, wanted to read it this summer and didn't make it to this one just yet. But I've read some of his other ones. I talked to you about them a little bit, but some I realized I did not have Goodreads um, reviews out there for. I mentioned this in the last video when I was giving some recommendations to someone who commented that they were looking for. Um, so I think it was procedurals is what I put this one under. But I really, really like Robert Parker. I've listened to some of his books. I've read some of his books. I will. I have others that are on my to be read list and I plan to read those or listen to them. Um, Robert B. Parker. I don't know why the B needs to be in there. Is there another Robert Parker that's an author? I don't know. But I love the covers of his books. Um, I added a review for Night Passage. This is one of the Jesse Stone books that they then turned into Jesse Stone TV series movies with Tom Selleck. They are fabulous. I love the books. I love the um, TV episodes. They are so, so good. Now, they are dark. They're very somber. Um, Jesse Stone is a uh, police officer, chief of police. He is coming from like Boston or New York. Some terrible things happen there. He's coming to a smaller town. He's trying to get away from some things in his past. He has some broken relationships. Um, his family has some complicated things that have happened. And um, he doesn't just walk away from it. It just keeps following him. He has a hard time. He has some drinking issues. Um, he is a ladies man within the town there even. It's so, so good. Now, that being said, it's another one of those that like I, in my mind, when I started talking about it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot. This is the one where on the TV episode, this happened and you're just like watching and enjoying it. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, like that, that should not have happened. It especially should not have happened on screen. Um, they're jarringly violent at times. 
So, so good though. So, so good. If you like a good police procedural, that is that kind of dark drama. Um, so super well done. Great characterization. If you watch the whole series, it's Jesse Stone and he is functioning as, as, as the chief of police. There is a lot of corruption in this small town. Um, and like I said, those big city things have followed him to this small town. Um, but developing that area that he is, that he's living in. I don't know if I have the name of the town that he's, um, become the chief of police in. No, I don't, but that's okay. Um, he's very good at solving murders. So when this small town has a couple of murders and some corruption things that are going on and they, you know, are like, you know, just lay back and let things happen, dude. Like you're taking things too seriously. He's like, you probably shouldn't have invited me here if you didn't think I wasn't going to tackle this. <laughs> so it's just so super good. I'm adding this one to my to be read list. I listen to Hush Money and I listen to Family of Honor. So both of these are on like cassettes. I picked them up at like the library book sale. Um, I'm going to guess these were abridged. Yes, both of these are abridged versions. That could be before I even realized what abridged meant. <laughs> oh, actually, I had a Goodreads review out there for Hush Money um, back in 2013. I put that review out there. Wow, that's a long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, my review is terrible too. It's like, listen to this today while cleaning house. It's a good whodunit. So I couldn't tell you a whole lot about it, but I do just remember that I enjoyed it. And then family audio, uh, listen to this audio while cleaning house this past week too. Love the new Parker character of Sonny Randall. This uh, family honor is Sonny Randall series. And this was the first one in that series. What about Hush Money? Is that a series? Oh, that's the Spencer series and it's number 26. So um, remember, I don't know if you remember, I mean, I don't know who you are, but if you remember the TV show Spencer that was a police procedural, that is also Robert B. Parker and that is Hush Money was um, that character, the Spencer character that that TV um, show was based off of. So I don't know that I ever really watched that. I just finished um, watching all five seasons of Heart to Heart. Uh, it was falling off of Amazon Prime, so I was trying to get through the whole thing. And I didn't, I didn't get all the way through it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, it's probably on something else. And it's on Tube, Tubi, T-U-B-I, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I finished that up last week. So I've gotten through all five seasons of Heart to Heart. I loved it. It's that cozy kind of mystery. Um, the guy, Jonathan Hart's humor and his one-liners that are always like very punny. I loved it. I loved how they dressed in the series. Um, so maybe Spencer's a series that I need to look up and see, like, I wonder if that's gonna, if that's like gonna be a cozy one for me. Um, I think it was probably a little more serious and violent, but as I recall, like he was, um, just a different kind of character that we haven't seen that kind of character before. So we'll see. I also read, um, Robert B. Parker's Lullaby, but it's by Ace Atkins. I think this um, might be that after he passed away or he was getting to where he wasn't writing, he let other people use his characters. Um, and so this is another Spencer. This is Spencer number 40. Um, but I, again, remember enjoying it. I remember, uh, well, I shouldn't say I remember. I'm reading it. I've reviewed it back in 2019. But lots of references to foods and drinks and like seedy characters and more like a gumshoe. Spencer, more of a gumshoe than... Um, than you know that cozy it's not not cozy but i really enjoy this series i would go back and do some more of the spencer i have plenty um that i've picked up <laughs> thrifting over the years and i know a lot of those not only did i remember the author because i had read and reviewed several of his books but i just remember that i i like the covers i think that they draw me in they look like they are great like pull you in type of books so let's look and see at some of the ones that are on my to be read list. So we have this one, which is school days. And look at the back of that. Look at that guy with his dog. Is that not amazing? Love it. There's school days, which maybe I should put that on the short list for getting ready to get, go back to school. Let's see what it's about. Celebrated series continues as a troubled teenager accused of a horrific crime draws Spencer into one of the most desperate, desperate cases of his career. There you go. I need to read it. Need to read it now. There's this one. Maybe I'll put this on the list for June when my son's getting married. Rough Weather, <laughs> a Spencer novel. Uh, Melancholy Baby, um, a Sonny Randall novel. Hundred Dollar Baby, which they made into that movie, if you'll recall. 
a Spencer novel. We have High Profile, a Jesse Stone novel. So I'm sure I've already seen the TV episode because I've watched all of the Jesse Stone movies. So I need to read that one. That would be a good revisit. Death in Paradise, which is also Jesse Stone. Paradise is the name of the small town that he is now the chief of police. I remember that now. Uh, Blue Screen, Sonny Randolph. Bad Business, Spencer. Whoops. And Backstory, a Spencer novel. So lots on my To Be Read by uh, Robert P. <laughs> Robert B. Parker. Um, and I look forward to all of those. I, I think those, those are books where I start reading and I just want to finish the book within two or three days because they're just fun, fun, fun. Um, so those are all on my To Be Read list. All right, next, the author I want to revisit is Rick Rordian. I um, have talked to you about some of these, but needed to add um, the actual book talk because I know I mentioned it, but I wasn't sure I'd actually done a good job of book talking it. And it is Rick Rordian, uh, and I wanted to add him today because there is a new movie series coming out. Um, I read Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard. I guess that's how I'm going to say that one. Um, I actually read this before I read his more popular, um, The Lightning Thief. And I read this one, The Sword of Summer, um, back when I was in the library and we were doing like, we would do summer book clubs. And so we would have numerous copies of a book and you could take them for the summer. And then we would, um, I don't remember what we did. Did we do some kind of online group? Did we do an email group? I can't remember how we did that because it was before you did like, zoom or google meets or i don't know i can't remember how we did those maybe it was an email i don't know but i remember that's when i did this and i had never read rick rordian prior to that and after i read magnus chase and the gods of asgard i went back and immediately read the lightning thief because i was like now i know why these kids really like this series um i am not a mythology person i just i don't know that much about mythology i never somehow in an english degree didn't have to take a class in mythology i should have that's abysmal. We should do that. Um, but I really, really enjoyed both of these books. And I like that it's, um, it's a low risk way of learning about mythology. It's not a textbook. I don't have to read ancient literature. I don't have to try and dissect nonfiction information. They are modern characters mixed with the traditional mythological creatures and characters that I should already know these things about, but I don't. So just a low risk, low risk way of introducing someone to mythology. And then if they are interested, then I think it would lead them to reading um, maybe some more serious ones or some higher level books on mythology. So with the Sword of Summer, it's the Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard, number one. Uh, and they're very, they're very adventure kind of books. And, you know, I don't know. I think you could probably start reading. I don't see a reading level on here, but I think you could probably start reading these in intermediate to middle school, especially if you're an advanced reader, um, that you could start reading it there. But you could definitely continue reading these high school and beyond. Um, and especially if you want to know a little bit more about mythology and you just enjoy that kind of an adventure, uh, adventure story. Now, your characters in all of the Rick Wardian books that I have read so far and know about are teenagers. So I would definitely call them young adult, but I still, like I said, I read these books as adult and I enjoy them. Uh, and then The Lightning Thief, I had a um, Goodreads review out there for The Lightning Thief back in 2021. So just going to revisit that super quick. It's the Percy Jackson and the Olympians book one. Um, and there are a lot of books in that series. There were numerous movies and TV episodes done about the Lightning Thief. Some are well done, some are not. Disney has purchased the whole Rick Wardian franchise. Um, and then let me see if I made a note about this new one. Yeah, so it looks like in September, the Rick Wardian, Percy Jackson, and the Olympians, The Chalice of the Gods, a new book in the series is coming out. And then a new movie is coming out on Disney+. Plus. So be looking for that, and I'll try and keep you updated on that too. But highly recommend Rick Wardian, and I just felt like I hadn't done him quite justice um, before when I was talking about him. So throwing those two out there. The next author that I wanted to um, come back to is Stephen Raleigh. I picked up this in a book haul, and I talked to you about it not too long ago. 
Um, and then I also picked this up in a book haul and talked to you about it not long ago. So I haven't read either one of these yet, but I read two other Stephen Raleigh books. Lily and the Octopus, which I had on Goodreads back in 2018, and then The Gunkle, uh, which I reviewed for you back in 2022. I specifically remember talking to you about The Gunkle. I loved that book. Um, I think it was, was it last summer? Well, May 2022, so before summer. Um, it is just a five-star read for me, but so is Lily and the Octopus. Um, when you're talking about The Gunkle, there is a man who uh, has lost a... His, let me let me get this straight. He's lost a friend. The friend is married to, I think, his brother. And they had young children. So the young children come and spend some time with him. Now, he's a gay man who lives in Palm Springs. And they the kids come and live with him for a while. And um, he doesn't know what to do with them. He has, you know, no children, no experience with this. He slays it. It's amazing. He's funny. His, um, you know, community is very funny the way that it's all dealt with. And then all of a sudden it will rip your heart out. So it goes between the humorous and um, the serious. It's beautifully done. Now, I would read it next summer if I were you. I wouldn't, you know, try doing it now unless you're going on vacation somewhere tropical. Um, with The Gunkle and Lily and the Octopus, they are both read by the author, I'm pretty sure. So, especially the gunk, I know I did it in audio because I didn't have a copy of it. And he is just the best storyteller. Of course, he's telling his own story there, but still, he is the best storyteller. Um, very well done. Uh, but then Lily and the Octopus, I read that book, but I remembered somewhere that I saw a clip or I read a clip somewhere, uh, or I listened to a clip, and it was him reading that book too. Um, Lily and the Octopus is bizarre, and when I try and get people to read that book, they're always like, what are you talking about? Lily is a dog, it's a Dotson, um, and the owner is trying to deal with the fact that Lily has an octopus attached to her body, um, and it is very metaphorical, it's a very unique read, it is sad, it is heart-wrenching, it is loving, it takes you a while to catch on to like what he's saying, because Lily talks, and Lily is has her own voice, and it's amazing, like even in the book, like you could hear it in your head, Lily is such a character. So just so you know, Lily and the Octopus is weird, but it is totally worth the read. So I have high, high hopes for both of these books coming from the author of someone who can write Lily and the Octopus and write The Gunkle. The next author I want to talk to you about is Brandon Sanderson. Um, I think I book hauled this and that's why he came back up. This is a great book. I love it. It's one of my favorite young adult books. It's easy to recommend. It's called Steelheart. But I also uh, read the first in this other series, Alcatraz and the Evil Librarians. I feel like this is more intermediate to middle. This is more high school. Um, and I, where is it? Ah, here we go. <laughs> I do have a, did I? Nope, I had to add the um, Goodreads out there to for Steelheart. I did not have a review out there before. But that was my first Sanderson read, and I absolutely loved it. Now, if you once you hear Brandon Sanderson's name, if you don't know him, you will hear it over and over again. You'll be like, wait a second, isn't that the guy who did? So how does the guy who's writing this also write this? And how does the guy who writes this and this write these big, adult, massive um, science fiction books? But he is one of those authors. He has his hand in different pots. Um, and... It's easy to, if you started reading this and then you come to high school and I'm like, oh, you've read that before, you should try his Steelheart. And if you're in high school and you've read Steelheart, oh, you should try his adult books. So um, he is someone who you can easily follow through. Uh, this is the first in the Calamity series. I would like to continue the series. There's three or four, I think, in that series. I would really like to get back to those. But it is based, it reminds me very much of, um, I think it's called Legend. Is it called Legend? It's the Will Smith one where he is, he has superpowers, but he doesn't really want them. He's not very good at it. Isn't that legend? I think it is. In Calamity, um, ordinary people were gifted with um, superpowers and not everyone should be gifted with superpowers. <laughs> some people can't handle it. So there are um, these people called epics and some of them are just very bad. So the main character in this, his father is killed by an epic and he is out for revenge. 
Um, and the epic that killed his father, I think his name was Steelheart. I think that's where that comes from. But uh, David is the main character in this. He is a young adult. This is a young adult book. But once again, I, sometimes I just don't think it matters. And this is one of those where I don't think it matters. The name of the, I said Calamity. This says the Reckoners book one. But I, oh, Calamity, I think, is the name of the second book in the Reckoning series. I think that's right. And then Alcatraz and the Evil Librarian. Very um, easy, fast read. Middle grade fantasy novel. Easy to recommend. There's about six, I think, in the series. Um, it follows a Harry Potter kind of trope that there's an orphan, you know, who is out there to, uh, you know, save the world, <clears throat> trying to find his purpose. It happens around his birthday. But this is more a funny series, whereas Harry Potter, there are some funny things in it, but it really is a more serious fantasy series. This is funny. Very enjoyable. Um, the next author that I wanted to revisit, I told you I book called this, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zavine. Um, I have not read that yet. It is on my to-read list. I borrowed it from a friend and then hadn't read it and then saw it and just thrifted it and then gave her the book back. But um, I really love Gabrielle Zavine's book, Elsewhere. I have copies in the classroom. I thrifted another one um, for here. Uh, and I re this is an easy one for me to recommend, and I often do recommend this in class. I had a Goodreads review out there for uh, from 2021. Has a very fresh plot line in that um, you know the main character is killed at the very beginning of the book. I think it's a bicycle accident. It's not important. What is important is she then is transported to elsewhere. And elsewhere is where you go when you leave this world. And so that's what the book is about, is setting up the story in Elsewhere. How things work, what do you do when you get there, how is this going to work, do you still remember things that happened on the earth, can you still interact with the people that are on the earth, so like Lovely Bones, but not dark like Lovely Bones, this is not dark. Yes, she died, yes, her family misses her, but it's not dark like Lovely Bones. Uh, and there's romance, big romance in this one. Cool, and I will need to revisit um, Zavine again. I didn't get a chance to add it, and I need to, but I was getting very heavy on the books that I needed to talk to you about, so I'm like, I need to go ahead and get them done, and then I'll come back to it. But I will um, put out a review for the other book that I read by her is The um, Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. Uh, it is also a movie. I've not watched the movie, so I will do that before the next time. I will put the review out for the story life of A.J. Fickery, and I will watch the movie and talk to you about both of those. Uh, and I think I mentioned this in the last one. Um, I can't review it for you because I'm not completely done, but 111 Places in Columbus That You Must Not Miss by Sandra Gervis. I remember buying it when I was in Columbus. I can't remember what store I was at, but um, I remember buying it when I was up there. And I told you my cousin and I recently went to the Columbus Book Festival I think I was headed there when I talked to you the last time we hadn't actually gone. It was amazing. Um, and I remember picking up this book and looking for a couple of places that I knew that we wanted to visit. One of those being the um, Topiary um, Park. And it is attached to the Columbus Metropolitan Library, which I think is also in here, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, the Columbus Metropolitan Library, main library. Um, and it's an Andrew Carnegie library if you know how that works and they had a cafe that was the Carnegie Cafe so I added that to my list of coffee shops that I visit if you follow me on Instagram um, and then it was also attached to the Topiary Park um, I thought that yeah Topiary Park um, and that was the first time that I had actually been there so super cool wanted to recommend that if you're a local or um, someone who just likes those kinds of travel guides that's definitely a travel guide i've gone to a lot of the places there but i just constantly return to it because i want to go to more okay that takes us to my book haul so let me move these and get some book haul books up here all right so a little word about my book hauls i am an equal opportunity book hauler some of mine come from uh free little library exchanges Lots of my books come from thrift stores. I'm a big thrift shopper and I always go to the book section first. So those books are usually 99 cents to $2.99 maybe. Um, I sometimes will stop in like a half price book. So those books are going to be more like $5 to $10. 
Um, and then every once in a while, I just end up in a independent bookstore or a chain or a Target or a Kroger and see something and I'm like, I really want that book. So uh, most of the time, you know, I do have a lot of books here, but most of the time my books are costing me a dollar to maybe three dollars ish. Usually I did walk into a bookstore um, on Wednesday and walked out and did not purchase a book. So it can be done. It was painful. I was uncomfortable, <laughs> but I know that I have way more right now on my shelf than I need to, uh, that I do not need to be paying full price for a book when I have so many that I've thrifted and I need to get through. So the uh, first one that I picked up since the last time I talked to you is Fool's Bluff, a Samantha Shepherd mystery by Lee Gregg. I picked that up in the free little library, I believe in front of Coleraine High School. Um, I keep a whole bag of books in my trunk and when I see a free little library, I usually just try and pop by, exchange something if there's something worth exchanging or if I see that it has a void, like they don't have any kids books or they don't have a lot of young adult books, then I will just leave some there. Um, and it works out really well. I remember I do have a free little library that somebody gifted to me that I am hoping my husband installs very soon uh, because I think it would be so fun to curate one of those little libraries and just constantly have some free books in there. Super excited about that. But that is definitely on my to be read list. I have not read that yet. Um, this I think I picked up now. I, I have been to my sister's numerous times this summer. So um, if I'm driving alone, uh, I usually pop by there. Sometimes I take my parents with me and I usually don't make them go by the free little libraries. But if I'm by myself, a lot of times I'll pop by. And I'm pretty sure that's where this one came from too. It's Diane Gilbert Matson, Hunting for Hemingway, a D.D. McGill literati mystery. Looks like a cozy. Um, it actually came from the Copperfish Books and Gifts, which is a bookstore down by my cousin. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Deb, that one uh, is for you. Uh, getting to the third date of Kelly McLemer, looking for the love of the X-Files, the romantic comedies. I swapped um, a book and put it in there and got this for my classroom because I thought it looked like it would be fun. And then one week, my sister and her husband were on their anniversary trip. So me and my mom and my dad went over and we took Stella and uh, did some house sitting and pup sitting for her and let Stella enjoy the pool. And we enjoyed the pool for a couple of days. And uh, we would normally in the morning run to a coffee shop or, you know, whatever. Um, and then one time we went to the St. Vincent de Paul on Estes Avenue in Cincinnati thrift shop. And it was amazing. It was fabulous. And I picked up some books there. I picked up this M.C. Benton uh, ha uh, Hamish Macbeth mystery, Death of a Liar. So I have read the Agatha Raisin MC Benton series, and I've also read some of the um, Hamish Macbeth, and I like them both. This actually has the sticker on the back of it. It was 69 cents. Now, um, I've talked to you about MC Benton, um, The Quiche of Death, Agatha Christie, number one, The Vicious Vet, Agatha Christie, number two, Agatha Christie and the Potted Gardener, number three, and then I read Agatha Christie and the Wellspring of Death, which is number seven. And then Death of a Ghost is the Hamish Macbeth, and that was number 32 in the series. So I don't always keep in order on those. I know I started the Agatha Raisin series, and then I was like, what am I doing? You need to go back and start at the beginning again. And I need to do the same thing with Hamish Macbeth, but Hamish Macbeth? Yes, Hamish Macbeth. Um, but if I can pick it up at Thrift, then it's easier to do that than to check it out from the library. So highly recommend M.C. Benton, Cozy Mysteries. I remember I really liked the Hamish Macbeth um, character, so that is added to my 2BR. I also picked up this copy of Notes on a Nervous Planet by Matt Haig. I think I'm going to say Haig. He is the Midnight Library person. If you have read that book, it is fiction. It is awesome. Um, but he is also known to write great nonfiction, which I have not read before. Um, and this has like little, I'm going to call them essays, vignettes maybe. Uh, and I've heard good things about it. So this is another one that I think might be a good one to put in my classroom. I'm going to have to read it first. But um, I know that he is a big advocate for mental health, so I'm super excited to put that one on my to-be-read list. Um, this is the Midnight Library that he has done, and I have book-talked that one for you. 
Um, I did the Goodreads for that back in 2021. We read it for our book club. I know I've talked to you about it, but um, I would just once again say, this is one of those books that years later really sticks with me. And when people, I'm around like book people and we're talking about books and this comes up, everybody says, so what would be in your library? Like, would yours be, uh, if you have read this book, she is contemplating exiting life and um, she's having a crisis with that. And the way that it works is when you die, you enter somewhere that has alternate histories or alternate lives, lives that you could have led. And hers is a library. So it would be like a book that you would pick off the shelf. Somebody else within the story, theirs is a record store. So um, a lot of us will always say, oh, what do you think yours would be? Mine would obviously be a library. But this is one of those books that um, it's interesting to talk to people because some people are like, oh, I really like that. And others are like, that was the most depressing book I've ever read. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it. Not sure which camp you're in. I've also mentioned another book he has called How to Stop Time. Um, but I don't have a copy of that one. Um, I did pick up a, a copy of Prodigal Summer, uh, but I did not have a Goodreads out there for that. I don't think. I've talked to you about Barbara Kingsolver. Let me get that out there. I have talked to you about her numerous times. She's one of my favorite authors, top three, I would say. I've talked to you about Animal Vegetable Miracle, A Year um, of Food Life, and it's nonfiction, highly recommended. It's a great time that you could start that and end that by the end of the year and just read a little bit at a time. It goes by month. Um, Small Wonder, which is a book of essays by her. I've talked to you about that one. The Bean Trees is one of my like top five books. Um, it's what got me started in book clubs. Um, I added, I'm looking to make sure, I added a, a review for Pigs in Heaven. And I talked to you about that one in the last video, if I'm not mistaken. Um, although Bean Trees is my favorite and Pigs in Heaven is kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, it's not near as good as Bean Trees, but I'm glad to revisit Taylor and Turtle's story. Um, it is number two in the Greer family, the series of two. And then I also added the Goodreads review for Homeland and other stories. It's another Barbara King Solver series of essays. I don't remember a whole lot about that one, but I still highly recommend anything Barbara King Solver writes. And then this Prodigal Summer. Um, I reviewed that back in 2016, and I think I did already talk to you about that in one of my previous videos, too. It's one of those that we did with, like, a summer reading series. Um, and then as I was reading it, I'm like, this is, there's no high schooler that's going to want to read this book. <laughs> so this is more um, new adult, I think, is probably that area that would really appreciate that book. All of Barbara Kingsolver's book have something to do with nature. She's very... Um, uh, what do you call that? Conservationist, um, environmentalist, all those things run through her books. Uh, and then I also reviewed for you How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons. It's a book of poetry by her. If you've not read it, go get it like immediately. Loved it, loved it, loved it. I have also read by her Poisonwood Bible, but I don't have a Goodreads out there, so I will add that for you. That's on my list of things to do. I still need to read her Animal Dreams, Lacuna, and I borrowed Demon Copperhead. So this is one that needs to get read immediately. I borrowed it. Um, I need to return it. And it's gotten great, great reviews. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal book, I'm sure. So I just need to get to it. It's on my short list. Uh, I had um, called All the Missing Girls by Megan Miranda. I've already read this book and talked to you about it. There's a good reads out there from... July of 2022, but then I picked up um, a copy of The Girl from Widow Hills. That's on my to-be-read list, and I picked up a copy of The Last House Guest, and this has the Reese Book Club on it, so super excited to read that one. I have really enjoyed reading Megan Miranda and my um, future daughter-in-law. It's one of her favorite authors, so I like to keep up with those too. Um, I stopped by a new free little library in front of Coleraine Elementary School. Again, I always have some kids books in there to throw in. Um, and what did I pick up? Ah, but when I pulled in to kind of see, you know, because they all have their own kind of personality. Um, they actually had a copy of a Clive Cleaver book, Clive mm, Hustler <laughs> book that I wanted a copy of. So I put some in and I took out um, the Sea Woes by Clive Cussler. 
Um, an Isaac Bell adventure. I thought it looked like it might be one that I might be able to read and uh, recommend in my classroom. Uh, you know, sometimes guidebooks are hard for us to find, especially because guys will tend to um, be more open to read adult books written by male authors and girls, like high school girls, really usually want to read like young adult books written for girls. Like, I don't know, it's just how it is. So I always try and um, have some good choices for my guys. So I picked this one up. I already had a copy of this on my shelf, so this is on my to-be-read list. It's Treasure, Dirk Pitt's Most Amazing Adventure, and Dirk Pitt is a Clive Cussler character, um, and he uh, is an adventurer. I need to review those. I don't think I have reviewed those for you before, the other Clive Cusslers that I've read, so that's on my to-do to list, but great adventure, and the Dirk Pitt character is great in the books, and I've heard there's a movie, if I'm not mistaken that I need to check into that and I'll revisit that for you in a later episode. Dirk Pitt was in he, uh, Sahara. Sahara was a Dirk Pitt movie, I believe. I will check. It says it's on Amazon Prime, so I'll update you on that. I read um, Atlantis Found by him. Super good. Again, just like found treasure if you like Indiana Jones, um, The Mummy, those kinds, National Treasure. You will like Clyde Cussler. I also read Ink of Gold by him, so I just need to add some good reads out there. Um, the next one that I picked up was Water for Elephants, a copy for Water for Elephants. Pretty sure I already have one in the classroom, so it might be one that I put in to put into free little libraries. Um, and I have a copy of Water for Elephants here already, and I had a review out there from 2021. Um, remember that this is a book that uh, I compared um, West with Giraffes was very similar to Water for Elephants, so if you read one and not the other, that would be a really good read-alike. And they also made a movie with Water for Elephants, and I've not seen it yet. Um, I think it's Reese Witherspoon and Robert Pattison, if I'm not mistaken, so I need to watch that. I've not watched that. But Great Depression setting and uh, romance, so I, that's a good one to put in the classroom. I also have a copy of hers. <laughs> Ape House, I already had this on my shelf, so it's just on my to be read list. When we went to the book festival in Columbus, I did pick up a couple of Christie's. Thankfully, I found some. Um, you know, they're hard to find. I've mentioned that before if you've been with me. Uh, you know, she has sold an ungodly number of books, but they're not usually found at thrift. I don't know why. It's um, people hold on to them. I don't know. Like, your grandma has them and she keeps them for 80 years. I don't know. So they are kind of hard to find, but I did pick up a couple of copies when we were in Columbus at the Columbus Book Festival. I can't remember how much I talked to you about it or if my other video, I feel like I filmed it right before we went. So I'm just saying, this is my first year going, first year for Deb to fly up and we stayed the weekend in Columbus, did some thrifting, some you know book shopping, um, and just, you know, went out to eat and had a good time and went to the book festival and it was right downtown at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. Very well done book festival. I was very happy with it. We meandered around the library, which was super cool. They had an outdoor area with booths and authors and um, you could meet like independent authors. You could go to, um, you know, like panels of where authors were speaking. We went to hear Maggie Smith, the poet, since we had both read her book and we both enjoyed her book. Um, she was an excellent speaker, made me appreciate her even more. Um, super, super good talk about writing, the process of writing, how to put yourself out there like she did because her book is mainly um, talking about her divorce, and what her life looked like after that, like what led up to that, how that happened, and then the afterward, and then poetry written all around that. It's so, so good. It is painful, but it is so, so good. And her speech, her talk, and I know she said it, and I'm like, it's so true. Like, I think I expected her to be very much more somber and serious and blah, you know, like a little dark. And she wasn't at all. Her The way she gave her talk was just, um, we both really, really enjoyed her talk. Anywho, while we were in Columbus, I added um, Agatha Christie's poster of Fate. Look at that beautiful paperback. 
And then a murder is announced. So this is a different one. This is Harper. It's got the little Miss Marper, Marple label here. Um, so that's an interesting one. And at the thrift store, I picked up two book of the month copies. Look how beautiful these things are. You know I love them because they look like this and they're up on my shelf. You can see I've got a little collection going. Um, this is Darling Girl by Liz Michalowski. It was a book of the month in May of 2022. And this is The Perishing by Natasha Dion. It was a book of the month in October of 2021. So both of those are getting added to my to be read list and they're beautiful, beautiful additions. Bottom at Thrift, I can't remember. I don't think these have a price in them. I can't remember how much I paid, um, but it was not very much there. Oh, I also had a copy of um, Postmark Murder that I thrifted somewhere, like right before Deb got here, but I already had a copy of that, um, and it was the same exact one, so I sent that one with her. I got that at the St. Vincent de Paul in Milford. And then, ah, there it is. Hold on. Hmm. I'm not sure. It says I also bought a murder in Mesopotamia. I don't see it though. And I know we already read it. So I'm like, well, maybe I put it up there, but I don't see it. But it says I thrifted a copy of murder in Mesopotamia, but I'm not seeing that one for some reason. Anywho, we'll move on. At the um, St. Vincent de Paul, I picked up another Louis, uh, Louise Penny a better man. So putting this on my to be read list, I've talked to you about Louise Penny numerous times, becoming one of my new favorite authors with, um, with her character, Chief Inspector Armand Gamache. I read Still Life, which is the first one. All the Devils Are Here, which is number 16. The Madness of Crowds, number 17. Um, State of Terror by her and Hillary Clinton. I reviewed that one for you. Um, so I am becoming a fan of Louise Penny, and I want to read all of the Chief Inspector Armand Gamache in order. Um, so I've already done Steel Life, and then I picked up some of the later ones. So I just need to go back and do the beginning ones. But really enjoy that series, and I just keep picking up any book I see by her in thrift because I know I'm going to want to read it. I picked up a, another copy of Anna Quindlen's Blessings. I... Um, I have several copies of this book and it's one of those that I feel like I just can't have enough. I want it here. I want a copy in the classroom. I want a copy to put in my free little library when I get it going. I just like to have it to be able to give to people. I love it. Um, I did add a Goodreads review because I didn't have one out there for that. Uh, and it's again, one of my favorite books. I love Anna Quinlan. She's another one of my top authors, but this remains one of my favorite books. It's just another, <laughs> I think it's my trope. It's the one I love. It's the a community of people surround someone who's going through a tough time and they help get them through and it's like found family. I think that's probably my favorite trope and that's what happens here. I'm pretty sure I started reading Anna Quinlan because of Oprah's book club. I have read How Reading Changed My Life, Black and Blue, Short Guide to a Happy Life, uh, Being Perfect, all of those. Um, I've read and I have several other of her books now that I need to read. They're on my to be read list. But um, a young struggling couple drops off an infant at um, uh, um, an estate where they know the people have money, but it ends up that not the right person that they meant to take the child in finds the child. Um, and then it's just beautiful. It is beautiful, found family. It works out. It's lovely. Um, I've talked to you about a short guide with a happy life already, but I picked up another copy of that because, you know, it was a dollar at the thrift store. How do I not do that? I have multiple copies in the classroom here and I hand them out all the time because they're just really short, inspirational, lovely um, books. It looks like I need to add Goodread reviews for Black and Blue and How Reading Changed My Life by Anna Quinlan, so put that on my to-do list. I also stopped at the Free Little Library here in my town. Um, and they had a copy of this, The Couple Next Door, which I have read and recommended to you. I think I already have a copy, so that one I think is for the classroom. Um, but it looks like I read and reviewed it back in May of 2022 for you. Uh, thriller, Sherry Lapina. Um, and I remember it being one that I felt like I could put in the classroom very easily for those girls that want like made-for-TV kinds of movies and thrillers. That's a good one. I also have a copy of... Um, the End of Her by Sherry Lapina that I picked up. So that's going on my to be read list. And then I picked up, no, Deb brought me a copy of A Little Yuletide Murder 
the uh, Murder, She Wrote series by Jessica Fletcher and Donald Bain. Yes, I know she's a fictional character, but her name is on here as the author. But I'm reading my way through this series, too. It's been super fun, and Deb gave me that. So thanks, Deb. I recently read and reviewed for you Jen and Daggers, which is the first in the Murder, She Wrote series, and um, Murder on Parade because it was a July 4th themed one. And I don't know why this isn't on my list. Let me grab it. I don't know why this wasn't included on my list because I bought it at Half Price Books a while back, sometime over the past year. Why has nobody told me this before by Dr. Julie Smith, Everyday Tools for Life's Ups and Downs. I bought it because I heard um, her speak on a podcast and I thought it would be a good one for me to pass on to my daughter-in-law after I read it. And I think it is going to be, but um, I just keep um, getting caught up in the next thing that I have to have read. So this is one that I want to, it's on my very short, I've already started it. It's good. It's on my to be read list. And then one of my students gave me this last year, and I think I forgot to mention it. Kylie made this little book um, bookmark for me. It's got like this little stack of books, and it's on this braided, um, you know, uh, like embroidery string. Love it, and wanted to mention that and say thanks, Kylie, if you're listening. I sent her a thank you card in case she doesn't actually watch my videos, which is fine. All right, I'm gonna have to break there because I need to uh, get ready to go to this convention. I gotta pick up my mom um, and we're gonna go meet friends for dinner and then go to the convention. So the uh, second half of this is gonna have to be videoed another time, probably not tomorrow because I think we uh, it's time to put up. We have to freeze peppers. We've already frozen some, but we got another batch in. I need to uh, freeze corn and can banana sweet peppers and can my, I can't say it right, but it's like shishito peppers. Um, I, and I've never done that before, so I think that's going to take me all day tomorrow, and I'm hoping my parents come up to help me out with that because freezing and canning is a lot. But school hasn't started yet, so I'm happy to do as much as that as possible before school starts a week from this coming Monday. So um, I got to skedaddle, and I will see you in a bit, and then we will cover um, book news, books to movies, um, lots to talk about there just to, to update you on, and then I think that's it. So Good timing. See you in a bit. Hey, welcome back. So I know you're still on the same video, but it is now, uh, let's see, I taped that first part Friday. And uh, then yesterday we spent the entire day putting up freezer corn and canning banana peppers and shishito peppers, which I think I'm saying that wrong. Uh, but we spent the entire day doing that. Today got up, went to church, just got back. My husband's watching the ball game upstairs. So I'm going to finish this video for you. So welcome back. We, I, it is in the afternoon, it's three o'clock in the afternoon and I'm drinking coffee, but that's okay. It's caramel macchiato from Starbucks and it is good any time of the day. And I just had a couple more things that I wanted to do before I wrap the video up. So let's get started on that. I do have another book t-shirt. I thrifted this in Columbus. Remember we went to Columbus, my cousin and I went to Columbus to the Columbus Book Festival. Put it on your calendar for next year if you didn't get there this year, Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm closer to Cincinnati, but about an hour and a half-ish maybe out of Columbus, so we went up there for the weekend, um, and we are both not only book lovers, but thrift lovers, uh, and I found this at one of the thrift stores. I believe it's one of the out-of-print ones. It's where it's Pride and Prejudice, and it's the, um, the words from Pride and Prejudice on the t-shirt, so there you have it. Uh, I don't think that I mentioned um, Vogue here. There you go. There was the newest Vogue when I said what I had read since last time I talked to you. I did read the August Vogue, and I'm sure I've mentioned it on this channel before, but I'm a huge, the September issue of Vogue person. Um, for years, decades, I have followed Vogue September issue. There's a great documentary out there. Please, I believe it's called the September issue. I'll see if I can find that link it in the notes too, but well worth um, the watch if you like fashion, fashion trends, um, in that whole fashion world. It's a great documentary. And then, you know, I think that the Vogue September issue has been kind of disappointing for me the last couple of years. Um, not really sure why that is, but I'm always super excited for it to come out. And since we are now into August, it should be coming soon. Um, I think like two years ago, one of my former students, I had put on social media that, um, you know, I live out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and admittedly, there might not be a whole lot of Vogue September issue readers in my area <laughs> or my circle, uh, and that's okay. But I got to where, like, I, I didn't have a subscription, but I would try and stop and pick it up somewhere. And everywhere in my little town that I teach, 
um, you know, the Kroger's and the CVS and, you know, that sort of thing. I stopped in all of those and nobody was selling Vogue anymore. Um, so I couldn't get it there. Uh, and then, so I put it on my, my list because then usually like for the weekend, we go to church and we go 30 minutes in the other direction or more. Um, and then we run around usually um, on the weekend when we're out. So then I started looking, I stopped in a couple of stores then. I think I went to a Target, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe something else, maybe a Walmart or something. And they didn't, they weren't selling the September Vogue. Um, so a friend of mine, a former student found out that I was looking for it. And she was like, um, I have these point system things going on where I get free magazine subscriptions. I'll just gift you a subscription. So thank you, Lindsay, if you are watching, I just sent her a thank you card, um, not too long ago, just because I really enjoy it. I love looking through Vogue magazine. Uh, but you can see, I finished the August issue here and I don't have any stickies for you. I don't have anything to like point out to you. That was a great article. So I don't know. I, I don't know. I love magazines, but they're, um, I, maybe I'm aging out. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm aging out. I don't know. But uh, just there wasn't anything that great in it for me to throw out there to you. But there it is. I did read that since the last time I talked to you. And then I also wanted to um, show you that I purchased this. It is the ALA, American Library Association um, Planner. It is the most beautiful cover. Again, my friend Deb works at um, a bookstore in Florida and she saw these. So we both purchased one and we're gonna use it as our um, reading planners, book planners. I don't know if you're a planner person at all, but sometimes you fall down that rabbit hole. And you know, whereas I've always been a planner person, I mean, I have my planners from high school still with my scrapbooks, um, but now I have different planners for different purposes. I have my school planner and my home planner and I've had a book planner for the last couple of years. Um, and I did really like, I don't see it right here, but I did really like the one that I had last year. Um, but then this year I tried something new and I didn't like it at all. It didn't work for me at all. Here we go. This is the one that I had before. Um, I do really like this. This is a novel companion. This was the second uh, volume two. It's by Little Inklings Design. So you can Google that. I'll try and remember to put it in my show notes too. But I did really like this. This was a great book planner. Um, it's very artistic, so you have some, you have like list pages, and then you have some that are more, um, you know, prettier like this. Uh, so I did really like this, and it had a monthly calendar, so I liked it, but I wanted to try something a little bit new this year, and these, as I recall, this was really hard to get. Like I had to know the day that it launched, I had to order it within the first hour, or they sold out, sometimes they don't restock like I remember it was difficult to get and I'm not I'm not very good at that kind of thing um so I was trying something new this year and I can't remember where I purchased this from so I'll have to look and see and try and um get this to you but this is beautiful and I know you might not be able to see it I'll try and put a, pi a picture in there for you it's lovely um but it's etched like falling books down the side and it's a TN like this oh it's going to be right here this is from creatingandco.com um, and it came with these little sticker things, super cute, like a reading, um, a reading challenge. And I tried doing the happy planner rings like this. Um, and then I had regular calendar days like printed out and I put them in here like this, but I don't like it. It's not comfortable. I don't know. It just, every time I go to shut it, it's, it's just difficult. It didn't work. Now I could probably buy a different planner and put the, the planner in this TN and that might've worked. But then when I saw this, <laughs> um, I'm like, Ooh, I really like that. Everything's already done. It's uniform in size. It's a great way to track, um, like what I'm reading, what I'm reviewing, uh, when my book club meetings are, I've got a little daily tracker in there for my reading pages, which I've really you know, made one of my goals this year. And then you can go by the week too. So I thought that was interesting. I started it, it started in um, August. So just started it, today's the fifth or sixth, today's the sixth, I think. So I'm excited about it. Um, and that I'm sure is still available online. It's from Source Books, um, but I really like it. I wanna say it was around a $15 price point maybe, but um, really like that one and wanted to show you that. Two things of book news I wanted to tell you about. Last summer I read The Agathas. This is by Kathleen Gla uh, Glasgow and Liz Lawson and I absolutely love it. You know I'm an Agatha fan. The Agathas is uh, a modern telling. It's a story, it's a mystery, it's a thriller. 
young group of people trying to solve um, a current murder and things go interestingly. Um, but it is a little bit of a play on when Agatha went missing there for a while. Um, if you remember that, if you're an Agatha fan, you know that there was um, a time in her life when she just went missing. And um, it's kind of this big mystery, shocking, around Agatha's life as to where was she during that time. Um, and there's, there's some things, she has said some things about it. There are other speculations about it or whatever, but there's a play on that with this particular story, but this is really a young adult novel. And this author has a new book in this series. The book is called The Night in Question, and I don't have a release date on there, but I think it's either out now or coming out very soon, so that's on my very short to-be-read list. I, this is one of those books that I did purchase, I paid full price for because I absolutely love the cover. Um, it's one that I like on my bookshelf. I like to keep it right here on the bookshelf and faced out because it's lovely. And then the other little piece of book news that I wanted to throw out there to you was that Sherry Lapina, the couple next door, I, I just talked to you about this earlier in this um, video even, and I had picked up this copy, the end of her. She has a brand new one coming out and it is called Everyone Here is Lying. So that sounds fun. Uh, and those are, she's just an up and coming um, author. I say up and coming, the kicker is, and I think I've mentioned this before. Um, when I was in the library, when I was in the high school library, I mainly read young adult fiction. Um, I would throw in some nonfiction. I would throw in some serious stuff. I read with my book club, but mainly I read young adult fiction because I needed to read as much as I could so I could get those out as much as I could. Um, and then I would say maybe like five, five-ish years ago, I decided that I wanted to read more modern fiction, adult fiction, and vary my reading a little bit more. Um, so that's when I picked up some of these more modern authors like Sherry Lapina, and I had never heard of her. Um, and now I'm much better at keeping up with what are other book clubs reading right now, um, the Reese Book Club or the Book of the Month and trying to read more modern fiction. Uh, and I've really enjoyed that. I think it gives me a different conversation when I'm out there talking to people about books. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, maybe it's just my perception, but I feel like reading has become more popular. Maybe it's the group that I'm in now, I don't know, but it's more popular. Um, so I like to be reading what everybody else is reading too. So we can talk about, I really like this. Did you like this? Have you read this? I read that. I love that conversation. It's part of the reason why I do book chats. <laughs> All right. The next little section that I wanted to talk to you about are some books that we are looking at that are, um, books made to movies. And I mentioned some of these. So just want to update you on a couple of them to make sure that we're on the same page. Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, I want to say it's HBO. I want to say it's HBO. I don't have it on my notes for some reason, um, but it is coming out and coming out quickly. Oh, it's Apple TV. I believe it's Apple TV, um, but it is either out or coming out very quickly. I am now seeing like um, clips and trailers for the movie. So that means it is right on time. And if you haven't read this, I would highly recommend it. And um, actually, I think the stack that I have here for you, that's probably why, is... Um, these are books that I'm going to recommend to my book club for our annual reading list that we are making this Thursday. So I recommended it last year, but um, we had a lot of competition. A lot of people had suggestions and there wasn't space for it. But I still think here a year later, it still sticks with me. I still think it will be a great book for our book club. And it's going to be in the news quite a bit with it coming out into, a, I think it's a, me a movie series, like a TV movie series. I don't have a copy of The Meg. It's by Alton A.L. T-E-N, but I read it, Mariana Trench, The Meg, um, like Megalodon. I read it, um, and I also watched the movie, and I've probably seen the movie at this point like 15 times. I love the movie. But The Meg 2 is out this summer. I think it just got released last week, so throwing that out there, that if you are someone who is watch that you're watching the movies, uh, they come from books, and very well done books. So I just requested the audio to the next one in the series because the only one I've listened to was the first one, and I'm like, I really enjoyed it. Why didn't I move on? Because life is too short and <laughs> busy, but um, I requested it from the audio from my Libby, um, my library, and I'm super excited to read that one, and I'm sure I will be reviewing it for you here soon. I still haven't got to Pale Blue Eye, which is on Netflix, I think, um, and I know that it has an Edgar Allan Poe based character in there. Uh, so that's still on my to watch list. 
Bronte, Charlotte, or I'm sorry, Emily Bronte's Withering Heights. Um, that is out there. It is called Emily, so it's on my to be watch list, but I've not done that. So again, just um, kind of reviewing some of these to refresh my memory and yours. They have now released the trailers to the new Agatha Christie that will be out. It is based on um, Halloween Party, but it is being the movie is being called um, The Haunting of Venice. So just so you know, and it's not just Halloween Party. It seems to be like a mix of some of the other stories, and they're taking more liberties with this one. So just heads up, but I'm super excited about that one, and I'm going to recommend that to my book club also. Um, because we've not done an Agatha Christie, and it would be kind of nice for my two book clubs to kind of um, get a feel for each other. I think it'll be fun. That comes out in September. I just got caught up on The Lincoln Lawyer. Um, I have the book. I haven't read the book, but second series hit a couple of weeks ago sometime this summer, and I am now all caught up on that very well done TV series. Um, so I want to read the book, and I highly recommend watching the series. Mm, Netflix, pretty sure Netflix. I've mentioned other, and I've recommended other Michael Connellys for you. The last one that I read this past year was The Dark Hours, which was a Harry Bosch um, and Renee Ballard, I think, um, series. Didn't love that one, didn't love reading it, but I love the Bosch series. I love watching it, so I'm hoping that I will love reading The Lincoln Lawyer as well as watching it. And yes, there is an old movie out there with Lincoln Lawyer. Um, I can't remember. I, I didn't see that one though. There are now trailers out there for The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Collins. So you might wanna take a look at that. Um, Ronald Dahl's The BFG, they're putting out a new one of his. That's not true. I don't have a copy of, Ron, of um, Roald Dahl's the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but there's a new movie out for, uh, based on that, I think it's called Willy Wonka, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but I've talked to you about the BFG recently. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. Ever, there's a lot of chatter out there. Um, about redoing Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka, because now we've got like, you know, three. Um, I can't think of the original. I should know it. I want to say Gene Simmons, and that's not right. Um, Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder was the original Willy Wonka. And then you have Johnny Depp who played Willy Wonka, and now there's this new guy. So lots of chatter out there. I always think that's interesting. I love that kind of thing. I saw that Anthony Dewar's um, All the Light We Cannot See has been turned into a short TV miniseries. Um, so I don't have that book pulled for you. Pretty sure I already talked to you about that one, but I'll double check. Hans, The Summer I Turned Pretty, supposedly was released this summer. You know what, I just read the book and I didn't love it, so I haven't been as motivated to watch that series, but I really need to watch that series because my students, a lot of my students love that series as well as a lot of um, new adults, um, young adults, they seem to really like the series, so it's on my to-be-watched list. Colleen Hoover's It Ends With Us, a lot of chatter out there um, about making that into a movie they've released, who's gonna play the parts. Um, hasn't had a lot of favorable reaction to who they chose to play the parts, though, which I think is interesting. Taylor Jennings Reed, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Netflix has picked it up, but to be announced, I don't know exactly when that's happening. In the Cozy World, Tanya Capes, um, Beaches, Bungalows, and Burglaries is her latest one, I think, in that camper series. That has been picked up an option for a TV series. I don't think I reviewed for you um, McGuire's Beautiful Disaster, but I saw that they turned that into a, mo a movie. That is young adult, but it is spicy young adult. I really like the series. There were definitely girls who I knew would love that series when I was in the library, so I'm going to look at that. Adam Silver is They Both Die at the End. Netflix has picked that up. I don't have any more information than that. I knew, I keep seeing um, The Cabin at the End of the Woods being advertised. I saw the trailer. I think it's already out there, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't realize that it was an M. Night Shyam 
M. Night Shyamalan, is that how you say his name? That it's one of his movies, so could be interesting. But it is based on a book by Trembley. And there is a new Color Purple out by Alice Walker. Um, I've read that, I don't know that I reviewed it, so I'll look into that and put that on my to be read list or to be reviewed list if not. But when we went to go see Barbie in the theaters um, a couple of weeks ago, there was the uh, trailer for the color purple. And you know, I told my husband, cause he doesn't keep up with any of this kind of news, but I'm like, man, you know what? We've already made this movie. Oprah made it back in, I don't even know when. Um, it was super well done. So I'm not really sure why we're doing this again. And then I watched the trailer and I'm like, oh, we're gonna have to come see that. <laughs> I know what the story is, but yeah, I don't know. It, it looks fresh, it looks well done. It's gonna rip your heart out like the other one did. Um, but yeah, so that's exciting. Um, so that pretty much covers the books that have been turned into movies that I wanted to talk to you about. And like I said, some of those are also going on to my recommended book list books. And I'll update you on that after Thursday after we have our meeting. I've got a couple that I'm just gonna show you real quick that I've been reading. I know I talked to you already about something you can count on when I talked about my book haul. Um, a friend of mine gave me this. I think I talked to you about it in the last um, video, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I haven't made it very far. I'm on chapter five. I read about another chapter this morning. Um, but it's, uh, I would say more for Catholics. I am not Catholic. The friend that gave it to me is, and she knows that my future daughter-in-law has been raised Catholic. Um, so she thought it would be, you know, good experience for me. And it has been um, because, yeah, it is, it's very different than what I'm used to. But it's been a great devotional read, and I'm enjoying it. Um, it, it, you can tell it is self-published. I've talked to you about that before. You can tell it is self-published. Um, uh, the, you know, there's not an, uh, there's, I doubt that there was an editor going on here. The author sometimes rambles on a little more than, um, I think an editor would have liked for him to, um, but he is very passionate about the subject and is really, you can tell his main purpose is to tell you, uh, why we should be paying more attention to Mary. Now, when she was talking to me about it, she was talking to me about like some of the miracles that have gone on that um, are manifestations of Mary. Again, this is a language I do not know, and I haven't really come across that yet. So far, it's just been the author talking about Mary and why we should have a relationship with Mary and why Mary is holy. And I, I just, again, I've never really been exposed to that, so I think that's been super interesting. My Agatha group meets this Friday. We are discussing a holiday for murder. Um, which is also titled as Murder for Christmas. We have already discussed this book back in December before, like right when we started the group, it was our first choice. Um, so there's that one, but I am going to review that one and listen to the audiobook. I just got that in on my Libby. And then yesterday I started An Appointment for Death, which is our next Agatha um, novel that we have not discussed. Again, we're doing that this Friday night. I don't have it right here. I think I have it in my bag that I carried to church this morning. And why would you take an Agatha book to church? Because you don't get in the car without a book. You might need it. <laughs> so I have it in my bag. Um, so I'm not going to show you that one right now. But um, I'm currently reading that. I just finished Hornet Flight for book club discussion this Thursday. So I will review that for you in the next video. Or did I already review it for you? I may have already reviewed it for you at the beginning of this one. I can't remember. Uh, but I just finished that. I have a, a couple of books just to throw out there that I'm going to suggest to my book club that I have not read, but I've heard a lot of chatter about and I have copies of them. Sue Monk Kidd, The Book of Longings. This has been um, recommended to me numerous, numerous times, so I'm going to see what people think about that. Mad Honey, which is Jody Picot and Jennifer Finley Boylan. Um, again, just heard a lot about that one, so I'm going to see what they think about that. And then The Maid um, by Nita, Nita Prose. Um, and I heard a whole interview with her. It was fabulous. I bought the book and I just still haven't read it. But those are three that I'm going to throw out there on Thursday and see what people think about them. I don't have a copy of Andy Ware's um, Project Tell Mary. I don't think. It's not sitting right here. Mm, I really feel like I have a copy of that. But um, that's another one that I'm going to throw out there and see because he seems to kind of uh, write a genre that we have not read and discussed in our book club before. And I just keep hearing great, great things about that book and I want to read it. So a couple of books. Now, one of the big, big rules in the book club, I created it <laughs> and um, we all, you know, decide it is our book club. It's not my book club. However, I am adamant that when we are choosing our to be read um, list for the following year, if you suggest a book, 
you have to have read it or someone in the group has to have read it and says, yes, they think it's right for our book club. So I've not read these three. So when I take these in there, I can't recommend any of these to the book club. I can just say, hey, I've heard a lot about these. Has anybody else read these? And would you recommend it? I can't recommend it. I can only recommend books that I've read so far. Um, and we have that because we have been burnt several times by people suggesting books and no one in our group has read it. And then we read it and it is clear it's not for our book club. We read widely, so I don't want you to think that we're closed-minded, but book clubs are very much like people. They have personalities, they have likes and dislikes, and I want our book club meetings to be pleasurable and stimulating, and when we get there, I want for the majority of the people who are coming to that meeting to have picked up and read the book, that they felt like they had to read the book. That's what I'm looking for. So. Um, we take all uh, recommendations, but when we go to narrow it down, the other thing is, you know, in a 12, 12 month period, um, we probably read, I'd say nine books because we meet every six weeks or so and we skip a couple months that are busy. So maybe nine books-ish a year. So if you are going to take a whole year to read nine books, I want them to be nine books that we all think that the majority of the people are going to enjoy reading. So there's that. Okay, that's it. As always, I am happy to be your friendly librarian. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, that uh, day that I taped, which was Friday, I spent the morning um, taping and I so enjoyed spending that time in here talking to you about books. I always have books to talk about, to recommend. Um, I like to keep up with book news and I like to share it with you. So I will edit this down as much as I can. I probably have mm, probably three hours-ish of um, filming and I will cut out as much as I can and get that as succinct as I can. But again, if you want to watch, you can watch. I love doing the YouTube videos because I like to show you the visuals, the covers. I love this part. I like for you to feel like you're in the library with me and that we are having a book chat. But if you want to just listen, you absolutely can. You don't have to watch these videos. You could listen to them on your commute uh, to work. You can listen to them when you're cleaning, whatever you want to do. I just appreciate that you spend the time with me. If you would like um, suggestions, if you'd like to tell me what you're reading, if you would like to tell me what you think I should read, I'm happy to see all that. Put those in the comments. Most of the books, if not all the books that I suggest to you, you can get at your public library. You can thrift them. You can go to your independent bookstore. You can buy them at Kroger. So feel free to pick up those books any way that you would like. I highly recommend that you get access to your public library public library card and subscribe to Lil, subscribe to Libby. You can get eBooks and audiobooks that way and those are all free. You do not have to spend a lot of money to read. It's a wonderful hobby and it is easy to pick up books at thrift stores. And um, you know, I like to show you the ones that I've picked up thrifted where I'm like, hey, you can go to the bookstore and buy this, but literally if you're going into thrift stores, half price books, you're gonna run across plenty of books that you're gonna wanna read. Hit the like and subscribe button. Let's be friends. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook. I share lots of bookish content. Comment, email, message me. Keep in touch, folks. Enjoy.